What's up guys? We have a hodgepodge of topics that we're going to talk about today. First thing I want to talk about is uh, uh, a particular swing that was sent to me uh, from a, a gentleman who plays uh, Division Three ball. He's been working on what I teach for a little while. He struggled working on the conventional stuff this past season um, and, uh, and decided after the season to to figure something else out and he found my stuff and uh, wanted a little bit of feedback on his swing so he sent me that actually the two different swings so I appreciate that all you guys out there who who have kind of these before swings on video it would be good to, to get those when you send me your swings and then send me what you've been working on the swing that that uh, that you've been uh, working on so Let's take a look at this one. This is the before swing. And as you guys are going to see, it's very conventional. See how the hands are firing out. The body is, is not really controlling the hands. The hands are firing out independently. This is what they teach out there. This is the craziness that's out there. I, I don't get it, but as many of you guys have heard me say, I see this same tendency in many different sports where they tend to teach really the exact opposite of what you want to do. You know, why would you not want to get your body involved in the swing? Your body is clearly the strongest part, right? I mean, the big, when I say the body, I mean the legs, the, the torso. You know, the, that's, that's got the most muscle in comparison to just your arms and wrists, but that's what they want you to do. And you can really just use the eye test. I mean, just look at the swing that they want to teach you and see, does it look better than, than a swing in which you're using your body more? This is what I like about the lead arm dominant approach to the swing, is that when you swing with just your lead arm, your lead arm wants to catch a free ride. So, you know, with our back arm, we can go back real far, right? But with our lead arm, we have kind of a limit. So we're, we're confined when swinging with two hands to what the, uh, uh, the, the stretching capability, I guess, the mobility that your lead arm has. You know, how far can it go? That's really the limit that we have. Like I said, the back arm can go way back there. But it can't do that um, and still keep the lead arm on the bat. So... Basically, that means we want to take the structure that the lead arm would want to take. Um, but in conventional instruction, they're just... Um, basically, they want you to fire the hands out independently of body rotation. So you're not getting... You're getting a little bit of your body rotation into it. It's not like a... You know, it's not like a... A 0% versus 100% kind of thing. It's... It's just that you're not getting a lot of your body rotation into it. Um, you can see that it, it doesn't pass the eye test because it's just not as as beautiful looking to the eye. You know, um, look at his positioning right here. It looks crunched up. It looks like he's running out of room. And then here's the position they love today. You know, th this kind of again lack of body rotation and throwing the hands out and you see so much space between the hands and the body. And then of course that cut off finish that everyone loves too. So now you've started the swing in such a way that you're not getting a whole lot of power at all from the swing and then you finish it in a way that you're not going to get a whole lot of power and people are like wondering why where, where their power went. And I get this so often that uh, where people are saying um, that conventional instruction, like they were really powerful and good before conventional instruction. Another thing he was saying that his coaches told him is that his swing, the way it was, and we'll take a look at the way it was, um, he's going back to it. He's been working on my stuff, so it's, he says it's a little bit more the way he was swinging anyways. Um, and I find so many people come to me because they're just looking for swing rehab. 
You know, they had a gr they had a fine swing, but then they got they bought into this conventional instruction stuff, and it just ruined them. But he was saying that his coaches were were saying that uh, you know your swing isn't going to play at the next level. It may be working here, but it won't work at the next level. This is BS, man. I hear this all the time. Guys are just trying to be bummer. They want to tell you a bummer thing. They want to, they want to bring you down in the dumps where they are. You know, I bet you it's some older guy, coach, who just, you know, is, has a lot of regrets about his own playing days. You know, and they want to bring you down in the dumps too. Your swing won't, yeah, it may work here, but it's not going to work at the next level. It's like a, trying to act like they know, they're in the know and you're not. You know, that's kind of, so many people just want to portray this image that they're in the know and, and you're not there. And so that's one of the things that they want to tell you is it's not going to play at the next level. You don't understand. The pitching is, is different, man. It's, it's completely different. You're not going to be able to get away with that stuff. And so they tell him to, uh, you know, he's got too much wasted movement in his swing. That's another one. He, wasted movement in his swing. Um, and, uh, I, I don't, I don't understand that, that terminology. I mean, take, take a guy, take a guy dunking a basketball. All right. The, the slam dunk contest. All right. You know how they take like those 20 steps before they actually jump. Is that wasted movement? You know, those, those steps that, that the, the high jumpers take before actually taking the high jump? Is that wasted movement? Shouldn't they just stand right under the bar and just jump? I mean, all that other stuff is wasted movement, isn't it? It's... The, the mentality in swing instruction is so asinine, ridiculous, um, that I can't believe that people are actually buying into it. Uh, it's so knee-jerk um, and shallow like thinking about about the movement the only thing that they really as deep as they go is you have to be quick to the ball the ball's coming in fast so you have to be quick so they're like obsessively concerned with just being as quick as possible to the ball no wasted movement man just get the barrel out there as fast as possible why don't you just bunt just bunt you can't get the barrel out there any faster than just bunting if that is your primary concern, just be a bunter. You know, maybe that's why bunting is so popular. I'm against bunting. I think, sure, if you want to trick, if you've if you got three home runs in the game and they're playing you, you know, deep and thinking you're going to, yeah, if you want to lay one down, I, I don't know. Uh, I personally, I'd go for the fourth home run. But, you know, there are times where I think it's smart to bunt, but to, to kind of, make the bunt as like a like a, a badge of honor you know which is what it is out there which is what all slap hitting stuff is coaches want to just um glorify the slap hitter you know they want to glorify the unpowerful swing that makes a hell of a lot of contact um anyways this whole idea that your swing won't play at the next level. If it's playing well at this level that you're at, then it's probably going to play pretty well at the next level. It's not like the dominant hitters in Little League suddenly get to American Legion and they suck and, every, and everyone who sucked is now good. That's not the way it works. And, you know, great. Ken Griffey Jr. dominated all the way up. And he had this same long swing with a lot of wasted movement. Um that these coaches talk about. Honestly, man, it's such a dangerous world out there. So many people are listening to their coaches. And uh, as of now in swing instruction, 99.9% .9 of the people are teaching the same don't waste movement, straight to the ball, junk. It just fires me up. I'm sorry. It's just... It really just fires me up. But I guess if it wasn't like that, I wouldn't have this occupation because I wouldn't feel any need to, to be saying what I'm saying. So I guess in some respects I should be thankful for it. So here's his swing after working on my stuff. And I think that this is more in line with what he was doing before. 
Now look how much more body movement he's getting into the swing here. You can see, I love this action. I mean, not a whole lot of bat lag, which, you know, I think people, uh, I think people really do get themselves into trouble with too much bat lag because they, they just can't get the barrel back to square. Bat lag would be more of an angle between his lead arm, forearm, and the barrel, or the bat at this point. More of an angle, you know, some guys can really get away with it. Other guys didn't want to play with that. You know, guys like Roberto Clemente and Jackie Robinson and Albert Bell, Mel Ott, Stan Musial. These guys, uh, Ronald Acuna, as far as a present day guy, Kyle Tucker kind of, I believe, does this too. They don't have a whole lot of bat lag coming into the forward swing. And uh, you can, I think bat lag probably can give you a little bit extra power, maybe. But for a lot of guys, it just, it puts them into some trouble. Because they just, either the bat lag is too much and it kind of gets their hands to tighten as they're trying to hold on to the bat as they redirect the, the lag. Or they just can't, maybe the hand comes off a little bit. Or they just can't square the barrel up in time. So, a good feeling for guys who, who maybe want to explore not having very much bat lag is uh, feel like there, almost feel like there's never any pressure going on in your hands throughout the swing. So your hands are kind of a little casted out this way, just a little bit, and just feel like it never, there's never a whole lot of the wave moving through your hands so that you do this. Just keep them loose, but just, again, feel a little bit of the wave move through your hands, and you're going to do a little bit of, of a uh, 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 of lag as you go forward maybe but just don't feel a whole lot of lag as you go through but keep your hands loose don't not feel the lag because you're tightening up just use other muscles get other muscles to feel the lag if that makes sense so this is great positioning you can see from here to here you got a little bit of a barrel drop I mean this is great nice and connected there at contact you can see there's no space between his lead arm and his body, as there was before. I have no problem with this swing. Look at the wide finish, and he's going all the way around. Look at that. Beautiful. This is way better. And this is what most people just do naturally. But then they start getting swing instruction from the time that they're seven years old, and everything starts getting tight and, and kind of conservative and slappy, and this is supposed to be the right way to do it. Um, so this is, this is good. I mean, I honestly, this is a, I don't see any really problems with this swing. There's no positioning that I would be like, Hey, do this more or do that more. I would just want him to continue doing the lead arm progression. Um, swing with your lead arm and move more and more towards that, that feeling. Move, you know, feel more and more of the lead side pathway working in your swing. And, uh, you know, if the barrel drops a little bit more than this, great. You know, even if it drops below your hands at this point, no problem. Feel, try to move more towards lead arm dominance. That's it. However you do lead arm dominance, I'm, I don't want to... I don't want to start trying to get you to achieve certain positions. It doesn't really matter. The positions, they're going to change naturally. What you need to worry about is doing more, uh, is feeling more of the lead side pathway and doing it your way, you know? And this guy does it in this way, and that is fine. And it looks great. Now, I did have someone ask about hitting the inside pitch with a, with my approach, with a lead arm dominant kind of approach. Now, let me just reiterate what the lead arm dominant approach is. Again, it's you're swinging with just the lead arm and feeling more of that pathway working, feeling more of the lead arm 
compress up against your chest as you start forward, feeling more of the barrel drop. You're going to feel these things when you swing with just the lead arm by itself without using the back arm. You're going to feel more of your body get into the hit. All I want you to do is, in your regular swing, feel more of that. When you swing with, without your back arm, with just using your lead arm, feel what's going on. And, and feel more of that in your regular swing. And allow more of it with your back arm. And that's really it. So, the question of how do you hit the inside pitch? I think maybe guys who wonder about this, and by the way, I get, hey, I can hit the inside pitch well, but I can't hit the outside pitch. I get all sorts of, hey, I can't hit the high pitch, or I can't hit the low pitch. Can you help me out with that? Guys, that doesn't have to do with really the method that you're using. There's no reason why a certain method would not allow you to hit, hit a certain pitch, really. With any method, you should be able to square the, ball, the bat up to any location of, of a ball. I mean, it's... So, the only thing that you would need to do is work that off a tee. Work it off a tee. I mean, work it off of self-toss if you have to. You don't even need a tee, guys. You need a ball and a bat and go to a field, hit the ball, run and get the ball, and bring it back and hit it again. I mean, we are getting way too complicated with all these things that we need. We've got to bring 100 baseballs to the field. We've got to bring three guys to, to shag. and You're never going to get anything done. Anyways, hit, hit whatever pitch you can hit off of a tee and work it out off a tee. If you're having trouble hitting the low and, let's say, inside pitch, um, and by the way, there's different, you know, is it, is it closer to the catcher? Is it far out in front? Which, which location are you having trouble with? I think a lot of guys think that you need to have a lead arm that's completely straight in, in my approach. A lot of guys who feel more of the lead side pathway will tend to want to have the lead arm straighter. But if you're someone who doesn't, then don't. If you're someone who does, then cool. If you're someone who does want the lead arm straighter and you're having trouble with that inside pitch, it could be because you're thinking that you can't ever bend the lead arm. Just have your normal start to the swing and then start bending the lead arm to reach that inside pitch. It's something you want to do. Again, work it off a tee with just your lead arm. That's how you know how to hit the pitch. Work everything out at, at its most basic level, which is swinging without the back arm. That's the most basic, okay, what should this really feel like? What should this look like? Then you add the back arm and just don't let it interfere. Just let it add to that, that same basic structure. So I can't reiterate enough. Work this all out off of a tee, whatever location you're having problems with. Work it out off a tee. And do it, do the swing with just your lead arm to start. You guys, I don't know how many of you guys are spending enough time just swinging with your lead arm. If you don't have a small training bat, I have one at theswingmechanic.com. But honestly, I just made that because I wanted to make, you know, the ideal bat for, for lead arm training. But any little bat should do. Go to your local thrift shop and find a small bat. I don't really like the extremely light, small metal bats, but that's probably fine too. Put a little tape on it or something. Make it a little heavier. But um, the one at theswingmechanic.com that I sell is, uh, is, to me, it's the perfect size and weight for it. It's a wooden bat, um, and I designed it specifically for lead arm training. Um, so I hope that that kind of covers... Uh, all of that. Um, work it out off a tee swing with just your lead arm. Let's look at uh, Ruben Sierra. This is a, a swing someone sent me recently. Now, Ruben Sierra threw with his right arm. So he is lead arm dominant when he's batting lefty. Let's take a look at his swing. Not a whole lot of bat movement. He's got a lot of leg movement, right? He could totally be tipping the bat towards the camera at this point and getting a little bit more bat movement. Now, some guys don't like the bat movement because they like the under, they have an understanding of where the, the barrel is, and they kind of like to keep it still so that they know where it is in space. 
that it's a little bit more of a careful move to not get the barrel moving at this point. I'm in favor at least of at least playing with getting the barrel moving, tipping it a little bit towards the camera at this point. Why? Because this is what your lead arm tends to want to do by itself. If you grab just a bat that's, you know, a light, smaller bat, your lead arm is going to want to, if it's going to deliver the most possible power, it's going to want to tip the bat this way as it start, as it, as it begins the backswing, and then tilt, tip it this way, and then start forward. It, it's just, that's what it tends to want to do. If you don't tend to want to do that, then that's not the way you do lead arm dominance, and that's fine. So you have to figure out the way you do lead arm dominance by swinging a smaller bat with just your lead arm. So Sierra doesn't do that, but look at how aggressive he is in his legs. You know, this is also a move. Look at that. I mean, that's crazy. And by the way, these camera guys who think they're being artsy by zooming in and then quickly zooming out, you're a camera guy. You don't have any creativity room to play with here. Just film the guy's swing, for crying out loud. Um, anyways, it's like these guys who post swings on YouTube and they're always super slow motion. How about just put them in regular motion and we'll take care of putting them back in slow motion. Please, it's a huge pet peeve of mine. I want to see swings in regular motion. In swing instruction, we don't, we don't understand just how much it can help to see the regular motion movement. We're always doing these super slow movement uh, videos of swings. This one, I believe, is actually in regular motion. Let's see. Yeah. There you go. So there's a swing in regular motion from the front angle. That's something rare. So there you go. Nice aggressive forward move. Clearly not hanging on his back leg here like so many teachers are teaching today. But look at how, how he gets that lead arm compression here and the barrel just flattening out. It's flattening out because it's aligning with the rotation of his torso. This is something I always stress. It's not a snapping move back that does it. This is important. This is, you know, people think, ah, what's it matter? You guys are advocating for the same thing. It's flattening the barrel. Who cares? I think of something Hicks and Gracie, the best jiu-jitsu player of all time, said about great jiu-jitsu. And he said, great jiu-jitsu is invisible. It's something that happens inside your body. It's something you can feel, but someone on the outside won't be able to necessarily tell what's going on. But it's extremely important. And it's the same way with the swing. We have to feel more of this lead side pathway. That's extremely important, and nothing else is. I'm telling you, nothing else is. You guys, 99% of swing mechanics can be mastered by you guys just feeling more of this lead side pathway and forgetting the rest. Eliminate all the other nonsense that's being taught because if you fall into that, they're going to have you restricting and limiting and tightening your swing in a way that is going to be counterproductive and it's also going to lead to having more swing thoughts that are just not conducive to hitting well and uh and it's going to make you worse so forgetting everything else that's being taught is actually a key step just focus on feeling more of the lead side pathway however you want to do that is the right way that's what's great about lead side uh this this lead arm dominant approach that i that i teach is that it 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 leaves plenty of room for you to do the swing in the way that you want to do it. How do you want to swing when you take a bat and just swing with your lead arm and you want to crush the ball? That's the only caveat. We're not talking about, you know, what, what you see in, 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 on Instagram with these guys doing that stuff, right? How would you want to swing if you really had to hit the ball as far as you could? So here you can see, I mean, if you took Ruben Sierra's, by the way, Ruben Sierra, I believe is number I want to say 700 or so on the pound for pound list, um, if I'm not mistaken, somewhere around 700. So he's a pound for pound great. Uh, I think he was second in the MVP voting one year, hit above 300 that year. So if you took his back arm away, you could see that this would be 
kind of a position that that he he would be in swinging with the lead arm by itself, right? This is a very lead arm dominant sort of position here. Notice he's not bent over at the torso. So many guys are teaching you have to bend over like this towards the plate throughout the entire swing today. And if you stand up, that means you're pulling out and it's a bad thing. It doesn't that whole standing up means a, is a bad thing. They don't understand what they're talking about. Standing up is not only is it not a bad thing, but it's actually a great way to sling the barrel into the zone a little bit faster. You've you you guys have probably seen videos of me talking about this move that Oscar Gamble used, that uh, Ben Ogilvie used, 160 pounders who smacked the ball out of the yard on a consistent basis at 160 pounds. And they tended to stand up through the hit because it would sling the barrel into the zone more. Look at how connected he is there at contact. That back arm is just nice and loose and by his side. It's almost like he's hitting from his back hip here. And then there's the extension. That's the home run he had in, in the World Series, I believe. Cecil Fielder. This is a... Cecil Fielder was number 180-something, I, I believe, 83 maybe on the pound-for-pound pound list. Is number 183 on the pound-for-pound pound list. Um, possibly him and his son are the only father-son combo on the pound-for-pound pound list. I don't know if Ken Griffey Sr. is. Anyways, this is a ball that went into the upper deck at Tiger Stadium. You can see it flies into the upper deck. You can clearly see it there. Not only to the upper deck, but like on top of the upper deck. I don't know how far that went. But uh, Cecil Fielder, number, I already said that, 183 on the pound for pound list. And he's a big guy. But notice this move. Now, he has more of a bat tip. Now, it's not, it's not a crazy amount of bat tip. It's not like a Ruth bat tip. But it's significant. The, even just having a little bit of a, of a bat tip means you're taking somewhat of a backswing. And it's going to get the barrel, it's going to give the barrel some momentum. This is, again, what the lead arm would want to do all by itself. A little bit of a tip. So that's why I like it. It shows me that he's feeling more of the lead side pathway. Now Cecil Fielder, and I think I mentioned with Ruben Sierra, he was dominant in his lead arm. He threw with his, his lead arm and wrote with his lead arm. Cecil Fielder is one of these righties who actually wrote with his left arm, which is crazy. Mike Cameron is another one on the pound-for-pound pound list. Uh, Ricky Henderson is another one. So you can see that this is not just a lefty thing. This is, this is a lead arm dominant thing. If you are hitting with your dominant arm as your lead arm, you are increasing the likelihood that you're going to have better mechanics. That's why we see 30-plus percent of the top pound for pound hitters uh, are dominant in their lead arm. Whereas this is just a trait, a handedness trait that less than 2% of the population has. So you can see that these guys who are dominant in their lead arm are more of them are making it through to the major leagues and then making it through to the hall of fame because they have this advantage of having better mechanics. If you have a son, I mean, who's, who's starting out. Obviously, start him out swinging with his dominant arm in front. I mean, I think he should be swinging both ways, for sure. But if you're only going to have him swing one way, put his dominant arm in front. And for goodness sakes, give him a wooden bat to swing, not one of these extremely light plastic or metal bats. If you do just those two things, you've, you've done way more than anything else, than anything you could possibly do. There's really nothing other than maybe spend the hours and hours and hours of throwing to him rather than just feeding him balls in a machine. That would be probably the third thing you could do is spend your, his childhood throwing to him, actually taking him to a field and throwing so he can see the release. Look at how flat the barrel gets. Now, Cecil Fielder doesn't have a whole lot of lead arm humorous compression. That's fine. Again, guys, it's however you do lead arm dominance. If he's feeling, he's feeling more of the lead side pathway, he probably doesn't feel it and know it uh, at this point, but 
if somehow you were able to step into his swing and you were someone who was very back arm dominant, backside dominant, then you would feel this, oh, wow, I'm feeling more of the lead side working in my swing. So he doesn't have a whole lot of flexibility. To, he doesn't have like a Ken Griffey Jr., Oscar Gamble kind of flexibility of that lead arm to get ramrod straight and compressed up against his chest. Do I think that's a slight advantage to have that flexibility? Probably. But the biggest thing is just do lead arm dominance in the way that you need to do it, in the way that your body allows you to do it. And don't worry about the 1 and 0.5% of things that don't really matter all that much, right? Um, so this is the way he does it. Now, one of the things that, that you're going to see here is look how the, the, the barrel gets very flat. This is universal for the most part in, in a lead arm dominant swing. This is one thing that's really not negotiable. Like, I need to see that barrel drop flat. Right? And that's pretty flat right there. It's almost like a relaxed look of the back arm. It's like it's not, it's not pulling or pushing over with the barrel. It's like allowing the barrel to flatten out. And that's something that the lead arm... Um, that you do with feeling more of the lead side pathway, but it's also something that your back arm allows. So your back arm has to allow it as well. Here you can see beautiful positioning there at contact. A little bit out in front, but I'm sure he could, with his swing, he could easily just whip the barrel into the zone pretty much in this same positioning of his arms right here. It's real easy to do that. That's an... The advantage of lead arm dominance is like many fold. You can hit pitches. You're able to consistently hit pitches in a more connected position, which means you can also hit them more out in front, which means you have a long distance that you can kind of adjust. So like, it's not just a power thing. It's consistency as well. There you can see no flip in that swing. Look at how long his back arm and the bat are in alignment. In fact, it's almost reverse of what you tend to see from people. You tend to see the bat almost finishing and flipping over here and, and a big angle between his back arm and, and, the, and the, the bat at this point. But here, he's pretty straight on, right? With his back arm and the bat, pretty much a straight line. And really, the bat never flips over. It's one of those swings where you never see the bat actually flip over. So that's how you know it's very body controlled. Look at how much of the, his body he's getting into it. So much of, of the swing is just, are you swinging hard? You know, I look at the shoulders at this point, at the, at the finish of the swing. Where are the shoulders? Because so many, so many hitters who are just, you know, punch and Judy hitters, they're not like a right-handed hitter's shoulders. If he's not got, if he doesn't have a lot of power, they're typically never even passing like the first baseman in terms of where they're pointing like they're just throwing their hands out and they're kind of finishing without like if you want power you need to start swinging on a consistent basis with your shoulders completely finishing the swing like you see from fielder here now here's a good segue because rod carew had i mean here's a guy he threw with his right arm so he's lead arm dominant right here Uh, gets good positioning here. You know, look at the lead arm compression up against the chest. Barrel dropping real nice and flat. But he just didn't have the... Men this is kind of Wade Boggs' style too. But he just didn't have that desire to pull his shoulders all the way around his body and just swing hard, honestly. His approach was, for whatever reason... I don't know why, but at some point he decided, I'm just going to try to make contact. Now, it worked. Here's a Hall of Famer. I mean, I have no problem with, I mean, I respect the heck out of Rod Carew, for sure. And in fact, when I was, maybe I have so much animosity towards this consistency craze that we have in baseball because I bought into it. I was a huge fan of Boggs and Mattingly, uh, Carew, Rose, I, I liked the guy. I actually didn't like the guys who hit for power. I swear to God, I did not like them. Guys like from my era, Jack Clark, Mike Schmidt, 
Eric Davis. These guys did not interest me at all. I liked the, the guys who, they were more, I bought into the fact, the idea that they were more the, the, the technical um, uh, crafty, smart hitters. Uh, but it, it's just, it's just not true. I mean, the ceiling on your potential when you're just a slap hitter is, is way lower, way lower than if you try to be a power hitter who goes for average as well. Um, so Carew just didn't, he didn't really take a full swing. He kind of liked to make contact more out in front. Um, but his lead arm dominant action at the start, I think just helps him. Again, lead arm, the lead arm, see, he doesn't get a whole lot of a backswing, so he's not getting momentum there. He's just kind of going from here and then right into here. The positioning here is very lead arm dominant, but his approach is that of, I'm just going to slap the ball. And, and like I said, Boggs has a very similar swing action, but the lead arm dominant beginning to the swing helps them to make contact. I think even if you want to be a slap hitter, I think to have the approach of being a slap hitter where your hands go this way is not the approach I would take. I would still start the swing with more lead arm compression and then just because that's going to give you some speed without sacrificing uh, the barrel being square as early as possible. So he gets the lead arm compression. That gets the barrel redirecting back here and then he's got a nice flat barrel early on, and then he can just kind of extend through. Boggs did the same thing. Um, so it's, an, it's just another way to be a slap hitter. I think Gwynn even had some of that uh, in his swing. I think to be a major leaguer, I think it's almost like, I would guess 95% to 99% of them are extremely lead arm dominant anyways. Even the guys who... I would consider not being very lead arm dominant compared to the average Joe or, or just an American Legion team. Most major leaguers to make it to that level are going to have a, quite a bit of the lead arm pathway working in their swing. So again, Rod Carew, I mean, if he just stopped finishing his swing, stopped kind of leaning into the swing and doing all that stuff that's kind of slap hitter-ish and, and actually, you know, took swings that were well, first of all, off the tee, I'd want him to, to get comfortable hitting the ball deeper, more connected, and then finishing the swing all the way around. And just have the intent of trying to hit the ball hard. That wasn't his intent. He was intent on slapping the ball to all fields. I just don't think that, um, I just don't think that that's a, a very good way to go about it. Because... Because again, it sets the ceiling on your potential lower than it needs to be. Um, the best hitters are the guys who had the quintessential piece of, of great hitting, which is power. Um, the, the slap hitters are never going to reach the value that the guys who had high power and high consistency have. Guys like Hank Aaron, guys like Harmon Killebrew, guys like... Uh, um, Babe Ruth, Willie Mays, um, Hank Aaron, these guys, uh, Ted Williams. I mean, Ted Williams complained about this all the time in the 80s. He was always complaining about the 80s slap hitters. Like, why don't you guys go for more power? Um, and he said that the instruction back then was setting hitting back 20, I think he said 25 years. Well, he may have underestimated the problem because here we are in 2024 and we still are having this problem uh, where we're, we're being affected by the instruction that was going on that started back in the 70s and 80s. And it's this conservative, throw the hands, stay inside the ball, um, don't have a long swing type of instruction that people just impetuously assume that is the right way to teach. And uh, we need, we, we honestly need some sort of swing revolution in swing instruction. 
Um, once you understand the stuff that I'm saying, it really, you look out there at the landscape of swing instruction and you just see a bunch of crazy people. Um, you start to not be able to, to, to not believe that so much of an industry can be on such a wrong path. Um, and it actually opens your eyes to, to other industries and it makes you question like, well, maybe they are, maybe all these people following this thing or that thing, maybe they're wrong too. I mean, it doesn't mean it's right just because thousands and millions of people are following it. Um, that's a big, that's kind of a lesson you learn as you get older, uh, which may surprise you guys, but I'm 47 or 48. I don't know, one of those two. And um, that's one of the lessons that you learn is that just because a lot of people are on board with a certain way of thinking doesn't make it right. Um, and uh, I commend you guys because you guys are actually people that I admire because you are willing to look at this small voice, you know, in, in, in swing instruction, on the fringe of swing instruction, and, uh, and willing to go against, against the grain, you know. Um, anyways, thank you guys for watching. Uh, I hope this video was helpful, um, and I'll see you in the next one.